Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 106. From the ashes of your failures are the keys to your success. Robert Rodriguez. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Videoblocks. Now, Videoblocks is a subscription-based stock media company that gives you unlimited access to premium stock footage everyone could afford. If you're looking for like extra exterior shots or things that you might want to incorporate into any of your projects, whether it be a narrative, documentary, music videos, commercials, these guys got you covered. They've got unlimited daily downloads from a library of over 115,000 HD video clips, as well as a huge selection of After Effects templates for like opening credits, uh, motion graphics titles, company logos, as well as motion backgrounds as well. It's pretty amazing. And at, on average, uh, subscribers pay less than a dollar per download in a course of a year. And the content does not get stale. They're constantly adding new content to the library every month. So it keeps it keeps it very, very fresh and you always have something new to look forward to. And everything you download is 100% royalty free. Even if your subscription is canceled, you have unrestricted usage rights for anything you want to do, including personal projects and commercial projects. And you keep whatever you download and maintain the usage rights forever. Now, Video Blocks is offering the tribe a yearly subscription for 99 bucks. That's 50 bucks off the usual price tag just for you guys, just for the tribe. That's less than 10 bucks a month. So to get this deal, just head over to videoblocks.com slash hustle. That's videoblocks, V-I-D-E-O blocks.com forward slash hustle hustle for this exclusive offer and don't forget to go to freefilmbook.com that's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobooks from audible so guys i got a little bit of an update for you i will be hopefully releasing a trailer for this is meg next week sometime i will be doing a countdown and we're going to be doing a release date so we'll let you know uh as soon as i know exactly when the trailer will be out. I'm super excited to share it with you. You have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I'm so, so excited to share This Is Meg with the world. And this is the first little uh, little peek into what we've been able to do uh, <laughs> in, in such a short amount of time. I'm really, really proud of it. And I can't wait for you guys to see the trailer. So definitely stay tuned. Now, I, uh, today's guest is Per Holmes. Per Holmes is an amazing human being. Uh, he's, a, he's a machine, actually. He created uh, an amazing course back in, God, better part of like almost a decade ago now. But he created this amazing course about uh, on high-end blocking and staging, basically just how to move the camera and to get certain looks and, and certain feelings uh, in regards to the movement of the camera and what you could do with it and really broke it down in a way that no one has ever seen before. And uh, he created a company called Hollywood Camera Work. And that course was so monumental that he has clients like Pixar, ILM, Disney, Fox, all the big studios hire him to come in and talk to their people in regards to blocking and how to move things, how to move the camera and how to tell story visually. It, it, it's been pretty amazing, pretty remarkable uh, what he was able to do with that. And I bought that course years ago, and it's been influential to me. He also did another one called Hot Moves about how to make uh, you know, the science of being awesome with camera work, which was really great as well. But the reason why I brought him on the show now is that he's created, um, I'm going to say it very frankly, the best directing actors course I have ever seen or even heard of. It is a insane and i cannot express this enough insane course it's taken him seven years to put this course together it is remarkable so through his seven years of development and also three years of shooting and editing the course kind of reevaluates every known acting and directing technique 
known to man. <laughs> and it just painstakingly like puts it all together in this insane volume. I, I think it's almost 30 hours of of, of basically a, a master class on directing actors. Now, I know directing actors is is such a kind of unique part of the directing job. I mean, it's always been kind of like when you when you work with actors as a director or as a filmmaker, a lot of times you don't understand their language. And actors have a language. It is a specific language that they understand. And the best directors understand how to speak this language. And if you don't, you're not really able to tell the stories uh, in its fullest capacity with actors doing what they do well. If you can talk to them and under and explain to them exactly what you want to do or understand their process enough to be able to pull performances out of them, then that is the magic of being a good director. And the best movies I've seen, a lot of times it's about directors who understand how to work with actors. Yes, the camera is very important. Yes, lens choice and look and vibe and genre is all great but if the acting sucks guess what guys doesn't matter how much big budget money you've got the acting and the story are honestly the most important part of any movie everything else is fluff as we have seen in many big blockbuster tentpole movies where you've got a 200 million dollars and you look at the acting sometimes and you're like really really and it's sometimes not the fault of the actor most of the times, it's just the director is not able or doesn't care to talk the same language as actors do. So what Per does in this insane course is he literally, and I'm not joking you, breaks down every known acting technique ever developed from every school of acting, and he breaks them down in this insane pyramid, uh, which was about, God, I don't know, it was probably about 10 or 12 hours, just that part of it. And it, I, I'm telling you, I watched this, This I, I took this course prior to shooting This Is Meg, and it helped me out dramatically because I've been working with actors for, you know, two decades now, and I've worked with Oscar winners, I've worked with, uh, you know, kids coming right out of school. So I've worked with the whole range of different caliber of actors, and this course blew my mind because it just actually started to allow me to understand what actors are doing, why they're doing it, understand their language. And it is so, so, so important. So I, I had to get Per, I, I reached out to Per right away. And I go, Per, I need to have you on the show because I, I, I need to share what you've done with the world because you guys know when I really like something, I, I, I shout it from the top of the mountain. And and this is definitely one of those times. It is, and I can't, and I can't I'm, I'm like falling over myself explaining how good this thing is. It's it's just it's just ridiculous. And in the post at the show notes at indiefilmhustle.com forward slash 106, I give you five previews of five lessons. And then there's probably, an, I think he gives you like a 10 minute preview of every lesson. And there's like 30 lessons on his YouTube page, but I put five of them up on the, uh, on the post so you can take a look at them and see for yourself what I'm talking about. It's pretty crazy. So I want you guys to really, if you are thinking of directing anything or making a movie of any way, any way, shape, or form, you have to watch this course. You have to take this course. No question about it. And at the end of this episode, I'm going to give you the coupon code that Per has been so insanely generous to get 30% off not only directing courses, but all of his courses, even bundles of things. So if you want to get a whole bunch, you get 30% off. Per, as long as I know what he's been doing and I have followed him for many years, has never done something like this to my knowledge. So this is an exclusive for the tribe. Anyone listening to this podcast is going to get 30% off all of Hollywood Camera Works' um, amazing coursework, but specifically directing actor so as i always say guys sit back and ready get ready to take notes but i'm not joking this time for sure per is dropping insane amount of knowledge uh, on the process of directing actors in this episode so enjoy my conversation with per holmes may i introduce to everybody mr per holmes uh who is the creator of hollywood camera uh, camera work 
um, yes. dot com, and he is an amazing, uh, amazing human being doing God's work. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, but but film but films God works. Um, so Per, thanks for the, being on the show, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, so Per, I wanted to get started with a little bit. I want to go back deep in your past a little bit. You got started. Uh, I know it's scary. I know when they do it to me, I get scared too. Uh, when you start, you started out in the music business, if I'm if I'm correct. Um, not completely. I actually i I did want to be a filmmaker when I was younger, like in the okay. '70s and the okay. '80s, and I won a sh- short film competition and okay. stuff like that. But then music was the equipment I could afford. And <laughs> right. I, <was> like, <laughs> I know that. I know that feeling. <laughs> and so I ended up getting into the music industry. Um, and, you know, that was actually, that was my screw you. You know, I'm quitting college and or high school and, and, um, and just working in the studio all night. And then I got a record out and it was actually a hit in where I came from, which was Denmark. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then I had a music career and learned like a lot, what what it means or what happens when you're medium, I would say medium successful in the music industry. I mean, it was a big hit there, but mm-hmm. I think internationally it was still kind of a blip. Right. Um, um, and that finally became my angle into directing again because, um, I mean, we're creating all these great music video concepts and then I was hiring these directors to screw them up basically. <laughs> um, and there was one thing that we did where – I thought what we had was really good and we brought in this director and then he just, you know, nodded and said, great, and did something completely different. And I'm like, this is it. I'm directing the next one. Right. Um, <laughs> and so the next one was a, like a huge a music video, like $250,000, green oh. screen, motion control, Shit. character animation, all that stuff. And that this was is- really my, ba- that was, that was my baptism by fire. Now this was back in the day when there was money for music videos. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> two hundred fifty thousand was in the middle there. I mean, that yeah, would be insane I, now. Yeah, I know. But, Tell me about it. But the other half of that is that you can make things that look good on a completely different budget. I mean, the only option then was to shoot at thirty-five millimeter. Mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah. I mean, just the pain you feel from hearing all that money running through the camera. I mean, you really want to cut as soon as possible. You know, I'll tell you what. I, I remember when I was shooting a, a commercial back in the day on thirty-five, and I had to do a slow mo shot. And it was a super, Uh-oh. it was a super slow mo shot, and it was like about ninety frames or one hundred and twenty frames. I think it was the fastest the the airy could go, mm-hmm. and all you would hear is that zzz, that sound of the film <laughs> flying through, and you're like, oh my god! All you see oh. is dollars flying through the. the you hear it. It is like yeah. nerve wracking, and you're like, cut, cut, cut! Please just cut. <laughs> yeah, and then all you have to burn through like another 10, 15 meters to stop the camera. Off. Right. Exactly. When you're going that fast. So <laughs> I know we just dated ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so, so you got, you did, a, you did a bunch of music videos and yes. then you started becoming, I read somewhere that you got kind of obsessed with cinematography. Um, no, I mean, well, so here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that maybe reflects to all the stuff that I'm, that I'm doing here is mm-hmm. that I'm half of my reason for doing it is trying to figure out how to do it. Okay. Um, so you're learning as you so, as you're teaching. Yeah. So I did so I did some music videos and commercials, and then I basically realized that this is actually not really my native medium in the sense that music videos, I don't understand why you would edit here and not there in a music video because there isn't a narrative. There's no arc. There's nothing evolving. And then I realized, well, okay, I guess I'm a narrative director then. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I shot a bunch of short films really to really to practice. And that kind of gave me all the problems that I needed to solve. And I felt that um, it was kind of pointless to just hammer on, for example, do, you know, catering and makeup and production if all I'm doing is trying to figure out the camera work. Okay. Um, and so then I started blocking in 3D because then I could just really block a lot. I could, I could uh, you know, block, shoot and edit five, six scenes a day. And that really amped it up. Okay. Um, and as I was doing that, I was assembling a reel for myself of everything that I felt I, I really completely understood so that I could just watch that again, again, and again, and again, and brainwash myself with it until it would stick. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I also just, I, I realized how hard it is to concentrate on acting and visual storytelling at the same time. And, and I think everybody has that experience is that if you want to concentrate on the actors at all, then you have to really let go of the blocking. Mm -hmm. And um, unless you then have a DP who can really pick up that slack for you, you're basically going to end up doing two reverses and a master and a couple of tracking shots. And then you're going to sit in editing and bang your head on the table, feeling <laughs> right. so incredibly boring. Um, right. Yep. And yep. so I realized that I have to become a lot better at this because I feel that, I mean, basically the way that I divide it in my head is that as director, there are two responsibilities that you have on the set above all others. And one is working with the actors because that part absolutely has to be live. All the other stuff you can, you can, you can prep and you can do, all kinds of things, but in terms of working with the actors, that's what you're capturing there is, is moments, and you can't stage that ahead of time. You have to have more than 50% of your head in that until kind of the actors can run on their own batteries. Um, and I, f I felt that it was impossible to do both at the same time. So I set a standard for myself is that I have to become so good at blocking that you can wake me up at three in the morning, hand me a new script, new location. I don't know anything about the project. I can just block the hell out of it in ten minutes. Um, uh, so, and, so basically, you're you're learning your craft. <laughs> it's yeah, crazy. I mean, it's that's, crazy, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, that's. I mean, I understand that a lot of people, you know, like to shoot a lot of things. I I felt that the things that I had done showed me what the pro what the problems that I had were. Mm -hmm. And I felt that it wasn't there wasn't much point in it for me to move on before I I became better at it. Because it's still, I mean, you know, total respect to to people who shoot a lot of movies and build up their skill set that way. But mm -hmm. I feel that it's a big investment to make a movie besides the money that goes into it. By the time you're done, you've spent years on it and then years going to festivals and getting Marketing, a distributor and sure. everything. And I feel that I would rather throw that energy about something where I feel that I'm bringing my A game. Yeah. You, and you, you, and yeah. so for me, it was simply, I, you know, there's, I don't remember which painter it is, but there was some... Um, there was some painter who's, who spent 10 years just learning all kinds of different crafts and, and didn't feel like he, he needed to paint in terms of having an output because uh, what's the point before you, before you have a bigger dynamic range and better skill so that, so that when you have an idea, you can actually make it. Yeah, it's the, and, the, it's the whole 10,000 hour I mean, concept. Yeah, it, it could be. Um, but that's just me. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to say anything bad about people who stack the bricks in another order and 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 build up their skill set by by doing and doing and doing. I'm more the stop and think kind of guy, um, mm -hmm. and I felt like I needed to figure out blocking, um, and that's where the master course came from because I realized that I'm, you know, I'm apparently it seems I'm doing something here that nobody has made for for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it could be really useful for a lot of people. So then that, that was kind of the last decision really is that this ought to be a course. So then, you, and, put, so then you put together this master course on camera movement and shot composition basically. Yeah. And, the, and when I realized that this ought to be a course, I also knew how big a project that would be. So actually <laughs> I worked all through the night and all through the next day just to make sure that by the time I felt like quitting, I would already have done too much. <laughs> <laughs> you're like well I've, I've gone down the road too much now I can't stop yeah yeah I mean now now now, now, I, now I have to finish it so I read somewhere that it took you about 15 months and over over, over 4,000 man hours to develop that that course something along I those mean, lines there, that, yeah I think it was a year, a year and a half mm -hmm. of desperate full time work to get that to go together that was just basically squeezing it in between whatever other work that I had. And then thankfully I got a gig on a documentary that, um, um, that suddenly, you know, paid well compared right. to all the other things where you got paid too little here. I got almost paid too much. Right. And that went straight into Hollywood camera work. That was why that this was capable of existing because otherwise I, I mean, who can afford to take a year off to do something like that? And so I was just working it in between all the other stuff. Now, I, I just so the audience knows, I took this course probably about 10 years ago. And it, you've been doing this for about 12 years now, right? Yeah, 
Yes, um, about Hollywood Camera Work has existed for about 12 years. I mean, obviously, everything else goes back a lot further. Than of course, that. of course. But I actually took the course originally. That's how I discovered uh, Per's work. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And I took that course when I was starting out doing like really my, you know, I started getting into my short film work and all that kind of stuff. And it was invaluable. It was so well done and there was just nothing like it in the marketplace. And there still is nothing like it in the Thank marketplace. Uh, well, it's the truth. It, it's absolutely the truth. And I'm not alone. Uh, if you have a, 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 a nice list of uh, customers, uh, Apple, Disney, <laughs> Pixar, yeah. ILM, DreamWorks, Fox, uh, you know, so all the big players take this course and see value in this course. So it's it's pretty amazing uh, what you were able to do. And uh, I have another yeah. friend. I have another friend of mine who does another course uh, called uh, Patty Bird from Inside the Edit, um, who does this. Mm-hmm. He, I've seen that. Yes. Yeah, he's about two hundred. He's going to have 200 um, tutorials when he's done. He's around 60 now. He reminds me a lot of you because it took him two and a half years to do yeah. the first launch of it. And when you have somebody put so much passion in what they do, it just spills out of the screen because we're so not used yeah. to seeing quality work. <laughs> and I think it's also – it's deciding to solve the problem. Yes. And um, because there are a lot of these things that have been – allowed to stay vague and for example there's a lot of there's um um there are a lot of directing techniques and and a lot of cinematographer techniques for example that have just never had a name it's just you hold the camera yeah one of these you know um <laughs> right. I, I and and i mean i have i have a need to feel that i have explored something enough that i found the outer wall and i feel okay this is the area that we need to understand and it seems like that's what he's doing also with inside the edit that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that um i mean if you really have to describe like literally the whole thing then how do you even approach that you have to get everything on the table you have to find enough patterns in it that you can find a way to reduce it. all this information to something you can actually then work with as an artist. And that means that once you, if your goal is to really explain the whole thing, then you also start to have to confront all the logic problems that have always been there, but that nobody ever really went deep enough to solve. Um, and I felt, for example, in, in, in the master course, for example, there is a, there's a move that I call a pivot. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason that I'm saying that I'm calling it is because it didn't have a name that I knew of. And basically, if you imagine that you have that you have one character who's standing still, and then further out, you have another character who's walking, and then you're tracking in the opposite direction to basically keep them in the frame. Mm-hmm. And then you can do that back and forth. And that shot didn't have a name. And but it had a it had a link to an editing technique where you keep one object fixed and then you cut around that object Mm -hmm. to get another object. So that object stays in the same place in the frame. And so I thought, okay, well, then I guess that's called a pivot. But it's that kind of stuff. That's those are the places where you get stuck for like a week just on that because, oh, my God, what do I do? There's something there's a logic problem here. And then you basically have to go back to the drawing board and solve those things. So, um, well, let me ask you a question. How would you approach just, I, I'm curious to have, and uh, have you answered this question. If you have two people sitting at a table, which is a very common scene in most movies, how would you make that interesting in your, in, in your, from all of your experience, what would you do? So they're just sitting there. They're sitting there having dinner, talking, no arguments or nothing. Just a simple two people talking, having dinner at a yeah. table, at a table. So this is really hard to do on the radio. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, um, do the best you can. Yeah, just yeah, just do whatever. I would say that I would um, I would do. Um, I don't think you have that much wiggle room. I do a couple of sizes on each, then and then I do some tracking shots that go a little bit back and forth, and then I think we're kind of maxing out. Gotcha. On on what we can do. The the moment there's any kind of movement or somebody comes over and interrupts them. Um, I might think about what's the mood in the scene. So for example, keeps the shot, keep the shots wider, um, in some parts, but that's actually more, I mean, if you're shooting full passes, Mm -hmm. then that's more of an editing technique than a blocking technique. Mm -hmm. Um, but why not? 
build some movement into it? Why not have one start away? Why not? Uh, I mean, I you don't could know. Create, but... You could create. You could create other things. But so if it's not just two people talking, so it could be someone walking to the table. It could be another person in. So it all depends on the scope of the scene before you can actually I, start breaking it down. I think you shouldn't take the script too literally. If it says they sit around on a table, around a table. Mm-hmm. Um, so what? What if one stands up and then sits down? I mean, basically anything you can put in there. So you just have anything to cover besides just two static frames. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. That's a great piece of advice too. Cause a lot of times directors will, wa- will read a script and they'll just go a scene and they'll just go, Oh, it's yeah. two people sitting down talking and that's what they do. They literally just sit down and talk. Here's but- the thing it's the, the script is like what a court stenographer would write down after the fact. And that can only be the tip of the iceberg. You can't, you can't see in the script why anybody thinks the way that they do. I mean, you can, I mean, already Mm -hmm. you, I mean, and that comes especially to acting. You're, you're in trouble if you take the script too literally because the, the script, the characters in the script are paper thin and you, um, some people then do script analysis to try to drag it out, but let's get real. We're inventing it and that's fine. So we, let's create all these new layers to it. And then once you, once you understand your characters better, then you could also all easily come up with some better movement for them without just having them sitting. Um, yeah, it all depends on the intention of the character and what they're trying to do in yeah. the scene. And that really so that the- makes it a little hard with, in a hypothetical scene. But of course, I don't know that you have a million options if they're just sitting there. Right. There's there's only – and then other than that, then you're turning into a music video. You can go up high. You can be you know POV of the yeah. flower. And I think a lot of times directors try to be cute, but – Well, that becomes style over substance. Then it's correct. Just kind of, then, and then it's actually a distraction or you know, let's shoot it through the bushes. Then suddenly it feels like there's a stalker there or – I mean, the thing is, the thing is, a lot of times I see in in films, uh, like film filmmakers do that is when they start making that style over substance thing, and they're like, "Well, I just want to make this cool shot," but if it doesn't move the story, the story forward, doesn't move the scene forward, or doesn't work with the intention of what the scene is supposed to do for the story, then mm-hmm. you're just kind of waving, you know, waving your you know what around, and just like, "Look how cool I can make this look," and that's where it turns into a music video. Yeah, basically, I'm not very good at that. It- in terms of making style in this, I mean, that's something that I recognize as a weakness and that's why I choose people to work with who are stronger than that because I actually end up being quite boring when I'm directing and I have to, I have to make myself man up and do some cool shots <laughs> uh, right, right? because, you know, once they're talking, then that's, that's the part that I'm interested in. And then I have to make myself make cooler shots. Is let's let's just put on another hat. Let's say that this was only about style. Then what would I do? Mm-hmm. And get some of that in there as well. What would Michael Bay do? <laughs> yes, what would Michael Bay do? Right, because I mean. Oh, and then I would also um, I would for a static shot like that. I would really try to get some other movement in the frame, even if it's traffic in the background or smoke or rain or mm-hmm. or whatever, because. Lock shots like that, they're really painful in the long run. Right. And you got to create some sort of interesting things in the frame to kind of keep the energy going if it's a static shot like that. And then you've got these masters like Scorsese who can do both stylistic yet works with the story beautifully. And that's mm-hmm. what he's built his entire career upon. But let me ask yeah. you a question. You've seen, I'm sure, a thousand first time filmmakers and first time cinematographers in your day. What are the biggest mistakes that you've seen when they're composing their shots or doing blocking or camera movement? Oh, that's difficult. I'm actually usually quite impressed. <laughs> when I see it. <laughs> a lot of stuff that people are just like, wow, that looks great. Right. Um, I think often too many shots. Okay. And, too and much coverage. coverage. Too much I coverage. Mean, yeah. I mean, obviously you can shoot too much on the set and then not use it, use it in editing and then nobody would ever know. But um, I think – well, I mean – Here's something that you would notice behind the scenes. For example, I've been quite an advocate against too much storyboarding. Um, And that's something that that has caused outrage in in various (laughs) places. But here's the thing, though. It's it's objectively true that when you you block from a storyboard, you're basically breaking your scene into these very little small pieces that you're then hoping to glue back together. And what you're not realizing is that each of these is a new camera setup. And moving the camera is the most expensive thing you can do on the set because then Mm -hmm. you have to redo the lighting and then suddenly, oh, it seems like there's a break. Then the actors run off somewhere else. Then you have to get them back. And and that means that 
unless it's a small change in setup, expect that you're that you're going to probably blow twenty minutes on not shooting while you're while you're rigging oh, the next if not, setup. If not longer. <laughs> yeah, if not, I mean. I mean, assuming that everybody's everything is up and running, and that's yeah. not assuming that you're suddenly realizing that you need to change the shooting direction again because you forgot a shot. So now we need to re- relight the master as well. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, but basically, when you block from a storyboard, you're doing you're doing one shot at a time at a time. Basically, one piece of action. Let's get the thing where you pick up the cup, and let's get the thing where you get up from the chair. And that is obviously very painful on the actors because it's one, two, three, act, and then they can hardly get into it before you say cut. Right. Um, it's really tough on the on the um, on the production itself, and it's terrible in editing because. Um, because you really depend on this sequence working. And I think I've, I've gone more overboard on this than anything else. I did a music video that was completely storyboarded from start to finish. And, and my line producer was just having a heart attack all the way through. I mean, it's just every 10 minutes, years over, you realize that if any of these shots don't work, then the whole thing is shot. Right. The whole thing is, is screwed. Mm-hmm. And, and so the reality is that when you then show up for shooting, um, you're going to realize that, oh, this storyboard frame is this place. And actually, this storyboard frame is also in this place. And now you start to turn it into real blocking, which is setup-based and not shot-based. Um, if you're smart, you do that. Or if, I mean, your DP eventually will ask for it because it would be insane to move the cameras back and forth between all these storyboard frames and shoot three seconds. Right. So basically... Um, you should be working for coverage, and that it, and that means that there's nothing wrong with using a storyboard. You mm-hmm. could use a storyboard. Sometimes you have things that are sequential in a movie, mm-hmm. but most of the things, most of the things in a movie are are coverage based, which means that you're covering it as though it were a multi camera shoot, and you're even though you're going to shoot only one or two cameras at a time, you're planning them as if all of them are running at the same time. So then you say, okay, so while they're here, I'm in this right angle master, and then I have this over the shoulder, and then when he walks out, I push in on the character that remains. And, and so you have this little dance that happens around the, the characters. And then you can go happily shoot them one at a time because you know that while I'm in this camera, I got that shot, that shot, and, and then sometimes you have some places in the scene, like entry and exit and stuff like that mm-hmm. becomes very sequential. Um, but if you think, if you do a camera diagram, actually, let me, let me change that a little bit. Mm-hmm. If you both storyboard and do a camera diagram, then you get the best of both worlds. Because in a camera diagram, you can't see what the shot looks like. And right. that's the huge weakness of, of camera diagrams. But camera diagrams are still the native language of camera work. You right. just You can't see height. I mean, how are you going to... Are you going to draw a crane up? Mm-hmm. Right, a, right. That's a little hard. Yeah, in in a diagram, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I do when I do setups, I mean, I'm a. I used to do a lot of storyboarding early on because it was kind of my crutch. So it was kind of like that thing. I'm like, I could hold on to storyboarding. And I still like storyboarding to a certain extent, but not as much. Maybe for more complex scenes and things like that. But for basic yeah. stuff, I do shot lists, a lot of shot lists and diagrams. So shot yeah. lists is like this is kind of what I want to get covered here, and then. And then here's the cam- the camera dialogue where the camera di- uh, diagram where I'll be able to move the camera around a little bit uh, to show the DP, hey, we're gonna do coverage over here, and we're gonna get this, 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 and this shot over here. Move the camera over to this side. We're gonna get this, this, this over here. And then if we have some time, let's play around a little bit. And then and then also mm-hmm. open, keep open to the the cinematographer because obviously they're gonna have some ideas if you hire a good cinematographer. You are gonna have ideas. Yeah, and I'll have ideas and, too. When, so, and, and 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 that's the thing is that if you if you can take a, a if you can figure out a way to turn a fifteen shot scene into a five shot scene, and yep. usually when you clean up your blocking, you can get almost as good a result in like a third of the setups. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing better than knowing that you're under time because that's going to be the first time you're actually responsibly allowed to be creative on a film set is when when you're spending your time uh, responsibly. Don't tell your crew that we're under time though because then everybody scales their effort. Right. <laughs> right. Everybody starts. I mean, I, I think it's probably good for a crew if everybody feels we're a little bit behind. Yes, uh, abso- abso- but, absolutely. But the point, <laughs> The point is that in in planning a scene, there's going to be stuff that you um, that you hadn't seen. You're going to be on the set, and then you're going to realize that there's this amazing shot through the doorway, 
and mm -hmm. I hadn't planned for that. Oh, I have to get that shot. How are you going to work that in if you're already going over time shooting these three second storyboard frames? And so right. even so, storyboarding is not necessarily bad for action for visual effects. There's really no other way to do it. Mm -hmm. Also, for anything that's sequential action, where things are basically pieces of action that go back to back, you don't have another realistic option. But even if you're doing coverage, the thing to realize is that the storyboard frame is kind of the first time you see anything from the movie. And that means that they're also a little bit precious. Mm -hmm. And you see, for example, in The Matrix, they came up with a lot of the production design in the storyboards. Right. I mean, imagine that they had followed this advice and right. not done storyboards. That would have been a different movie. But again, but that was the kind of movie that was. And they were taking it from the graphic novel and the Japanese anime. Like, yeah. So it made perfect sense. It was such a visual movie that they wanted to kind of re – they really – but also, I don't know if you know this, they beat that script up for almost three to five years. So yeah. they were beating that up so much. And then the sequels did not have that much time, obviously. But <laughs> the uh, the first one, the first one, they beat it up so much. That's why it's a masterpiece for what they did. It is so, yeah, and I have that art of. I think it's great. Yeah. I, I wasn't crazy about the sequels, but um, yeah, yeah, the art of Matrix book that I got, uh, that I still have, yeah. has all the artwork, all the storyboards. So it is, it is beneficial, but also they beat, they spent so much time pacing all that out, um, mm -hmm. doing animatics. Uh, and what are your feelings on animatics as a general statement? I know, like David Fincher, animatics. You mean, mean previous? Yeah, previous. Like I know, yeah. I know. Uh, well, I pre David Fincher a lot. Okay. And and actually, a lot of Hollywood camera work users, that's probably my most famous audience, mm -hmm. uh, is basically anybody who does previs uh, uses this. And mm -hmm. that means that, um, that you know, it, I mean, basically, these techniques and these ways of think, thinking about it are basically used on every blockbuster that you see. Because I, I know a ton of these previs people working on, on Batman and Avatar and The Hobbit and, mm -hmm. and, and all this kind of stuff because – it's also, I mean, in previous, that is what you're doing. You're basically blocking. And so, you know, who doesn't want more input on, on that if you're sitting in that role? And right. I mean, the whole course, the whole master course is really in kind of a previous environment. Yeah. And I, it is. I think previous is much better than storyboards. Um, oh, yeah. It does mean that you have to either be able to animate or know somebody who can animate, but it doesn't have to be hard. You can just have these stick figures floating around. Um, because the moment you have an actual scene up and running and you have a character moving, then you very naturally start putting in a shot and then you start putting in different shots and then you're basically getting, as you would in live action, getting the same coverage over and over from different angles. And then you render out all these pieces and take them into editing and then now you're almost working in 3D the same way as you would in live action, that you're working right. with footage, you're, mm -hmm. you're working with takes that go long and have interesting things at the end and, and all that stuff. And so I think that's a great thing to do, both for regular scenes and I think for – because there's also – there's there's a huge minus that I think it takes a while to figure out in storyboards, which is that you get timing terribly wrong in storyboards. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had to think about that for, for a long time, about why that was. I'd done – this music video that I talked about that was storyboarded, I storyboarded that out and, and it was edited. I had time codes in the script. I'm not kidding. You. <laughs> um, but then I saw it afterwards and then I just – it felt so slow. And my, my mm -hmm. editor was hating me because I would left like literally no editing options. He was like trying to just go a little bit back and forth between the previous shot to just get the edit rate up. But I, mm -hmm. there wasn't even any handle in anything. Um, and I think that the reason is that a hand drawing just simply takes longer to read than a shot. And that means that as soon as you, what takes you two seconds to s understand in a drawing takes you one second to understand in an actual shot. Yeah. And that means that if you, if you're stuck on your storyboard, especially because in a music video, you're kind of tied, you're tied to your time base. You can't make it go faster. At least you can do that in a movie. Um, it was funny that it was just agonizingly slow and and but in previs you get the timing right because yes. it's it's much closer to the real thing you can look at it and understand what it is in a microsecond well i mean david fincher is famous for that because he he uh, previses this entire movie i mean he does it to the nauseum yeah. he's like he's basically the kubrick of our day in that sense he's so anal mm -hmm. and so technical but he literally like he like literally there's just another side there's uh -huh. another side to that because obviously a lot of the scenes that are in a movie like that mm -hmm. are not really worth 
pre-vising. But if if you if you literally do it to the whole movie, then you get a new thing that you can do, which is that you can see how you should have shot it, and then you can and now you know that for when you really shot it, sh- shoot it. Because otherwise, mm-hmm. when you see what you've shot, that's the first time you realize what you should have done. And so right, you, it's painful. You can skip. <laughs> you can skip that step. Right. Um, and you can because you you're going to find all kinds of story weaknesses. You're going to find pacing weaknesses. You're going to. Mm-hmm find it suddenly weird that we're cutting back and forth between these two plots. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, and you're going to, I mean, you're actually going to get a sense of the rhythm of the whole thing. And I think anybody who has the resources should do something like that. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and by the way, do the straight up blocking. I don't think it's an extravagant thing. I, I just think that if you can't animate, then you need to be able to hire somebody who can animate. And pre an entire movie is like real work. No, um, that's, that's so a you team. You need to suddenly be funded, like properly funded in order to do that. But I think that's a great thing. And there are some programs. Um, there's a shout out, for example, to something called Movie Storm. Movie, okay. MovieStorm.co.uk. It's actually made by Hollywood Camwork users who wanted something to block in. Um, movie Storm, okay. I, I don't know what's going on with iClone. Um, it seems like everything is getting great except the camera work, but obviously that can change mm-hmm. on a moment's notice. Um, but there are programs that allow you to do something, and I think even if it's crude and if the camera is kind of robotic, I still think that's worth. I still think that's worth doing because you're probably going to learn something about what you're shooting, and then um, so that's that's going to be kind of the beta that you do there, and then you can. Maybe do it better when you shoot it for real. I'll uh, I'll definitely put links to those uh, to those applications in the show notes for everybody listening. Um, no, a quick story: when I was doing my, I did an animated a Japanese animated movie that I co-directed with uh, a good friend of mine who's the artist, and uh, he originally gave me thirty shots for the whole for the whole thing. So then I I did a, a, a scratch track to it to prove to him like that you're going to need more than this. And he's never edited before in his life. So when I put it together, you just found the pacing was just so slow. And we ended up with 95 shots when I was done with them. Poor guy. Took him something that was going to take him a month, took him a year <laughs> when yeah. I was done. But you got the pace. And that's something that uh, – and that's something else you could do with storyboards if you can't at least pre If you can do a rough track uh, you know, of the scene and at least just a scratch track and then just edit – the storyboards, yeah, you're not going to get the movement, but it's something, maybe a little bit more low budget. Which, but if you can mm-hmm. do it other ways, that'd be better too. By the way, this is also another really good reason for um, for not shooting sequentially. I kind of hinted at it before, but when you're shooting se- what I call sequentially, basically back to back storyboards, you're really locking down your edit. And I think it's important to realize that you suck as a judge of timing on the set. And the same thing is in terms of how to pace an acting performance. It's important to realize that that pacing happens in editing. And that means that whatever floats your boat on the set, whatever the actors feel like doing Mm -hmm. is fine. Because if you have concurrent shots and you're, and you're working in parallel, then, and you know that no matter where we are in in the scene, I have two or three editing options. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't control, you can only control time on the edit point because that's where you can jump ahead or jump back in time on the edit point. But when you have to stay in a single shot, the only way you can make it go faster or slower is to actually speed it up, which would be idiotic. Right. Um, And that's why if you shoot for coverage and you just always make sure that no matter where you are in the scene, I have two or three cutting options. And also make sure that not all your shots are so wide that you can see everybody because continuity becomes harder the more people you have in a shot. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so if you make sure that you have singles and, and editing options, then you can make the pacing um, uh, in editing. And that also means that you don't have to obsess over the pacing. I mean, okay, so what that there's a little dead air in the acting performance? I mean, if the actors feel good doing it, don't fix that problem. Just speed it up in editing yeah flow just flow um, with it just flow with it well it it means that you can remove a burden and also by the mm-hmm. way i mean when you when you try to fix a technical problem like that with an actor that's really bad they have to stop almost everything they're doing in order to fix that one problem it's not their job uh, to fix that i think it's the it's the job of the director and the editor to fix that you can post. cover you can mm-hmm. cover around that but but the but the moral of the story is that i think it's bad to assume that you understand timing when you're on the set because when you see it in the edit what 
if the scene that you thought was going to be f- before was like really intense and then this is your landing scene, you're supposed to really come down and then you realize later that that whole scene that went before is actually gone now. Mm-hmm. So now we're coming from a slow scene to a slow scene and now I need the scene to go faster or the other way around. You don't really know what context it's going to go into. <clears throat> and I just think it's a, it's a mistake to assume that you fully understand the timing in the scene when you're on the set. You need to block in a way that leaves the timing open enough. Absolutely. No, no question about it. Now, I, I, uh, two, two, of my, two other courses you took uh, that you, I took of yours, which are awesome. Uh, is, and my favorite is the VFX for directors, which I want to talk to you about. But then also Hot Moves, The Science of Awesome. Please mm-hmm. tell me how that came into play. <laughs> Well, which one? Hot moves? Hot moves. Yeah, hot moves. Okay. So um, actually half of the techniques that are in there, um, I I was trying to figure those out while I was making the master course, but um, I, that, that was only a hunch at that time. And then I felt it's better to leave it out because it is a separate layer. And because basically one of the You know, one of the dogmatic lessons of the master course is that you should try to get your camera work to make sense. Don't do shots just because they look awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, And so uh, hot moves is is all the opposite of that, is that this is this is just uh, how you make them look nice. And basically there was something that I'd realized, but it took it took really a while. It took me like eight years for something like that, for that to really crystallize Mm -hmm. which things it were that um, that made. I found a commonality be- between basically all the shots that people feel like putting in the trailers over and over and over again because there's a certain dynamic in those shots. Right. Um, and that's, that's what Hot Moves is. It's this uh, – it's, I mean it basically centers around these things that I call – I'll see if I can remember them. There's, there's grid theory. Mm-hmm. There's angle on a track. Mm-hmm. There's roll and there's one, <laughs> there's one more that I forgot now. Right, right, but right. But basically for example – so – Grid theory is a kind of parallax that I don't think people have – I mean I think obviously there are lots of people who do it intuitively. Uh, a person like Michael Bay does that intuitively oh, all day long. All day. Um, and Hon- it's basically – oh, go ahead. No, honestly, I, and I just want to say something I, you know, about Michael Bay. I know Michael Bay gets a, a lot of crap for being Michael Bay. But I have to tell – and this is just my opinion. I think he is one of the most visual and groundbreaking directors – in what he does, because if you look back, mm-hmm. every current action film, his language is what has been taken. They're taking stuff that he was doing back in Bad Boys, The Rock, mm-hmm. and Armageddon. Those techniques are what the norm is now and were revolutionary when he started doing them. So as an mm-hmm. action director, there is – I mean you could talk about story, development, character, acting, all that stuff. That's fine. But on purely as creating awesome shots – there is uh-huh. probably nobody else on the planet that does no, it better than him. He's elevated that to an art form. Absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 I, and he I makes, totally agree. And yeah. um, I mean, obviously, I know people who had a hard time uh, working with him. But on oh, the yeah. flip side, right. uh, there are also a lot of actors who say that the that the tales of the awful directing of Michael Bay are greatly exaggerated. Right. Um, because there is also there is also another side to it, um, <laughs> which which is that. If he recognizes, and I think he's pretty honest about where he is in terms of working with actors, Mm -hmm. then at least he's not pretending. And then he's not trying to, you know, let me open up your brain and poke around a little bit. And Mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. was this thing from your childhood and all that kind of stuff? (laughs) You know, he can kind of more stand back and, you know, just uh, make it faster. And (laughs) and then leaves, then, then that leaves actors to figure that out. And that's one of the reasons why, um, in directing actors, I'm kind of pushing back a lot on this whole thing that result directing is bad because it's really not true. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where that came from. So explain um, that a little bit. Explain that. Result directing? This is a major change of topic. I'm happy to go there. But. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, 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 I, well, I'll go back to it. Let's continue with, with, <laughs> yeah. with the science of awesome, but I want to go back to results mm-hmm. of, of uh, acting. Go ahead. <clears throat> directing. Yes. Okay. So – so that was hot moves um, that I didn't feel simply that I was ready to do it. I didn't feel that I had figured it out uh, properly. Um, so it is a separate layer, although I do think that now that I know how all those things fit together, I feel like they ought to be one course. And mm-hmm. I guess at some point I'm going to do a version 
a version two of the master course. And then I think one of the, I would try to integrate them because there, there is still some overlap because some of the techniques are kind of getting started in the master course. So there's not as good a separation. But I mean, if they were to be separate, there maybe also ought to be more separation between them. But I feel that they belong together. So, and, but, but the basics, so yeah. basics of, so the audience understands is the master course is kind of like the meat and potatoes of, yes. of, 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 Co- camera composition and camera movement. And, and that, is, that is the stuff that you really have to do, be able to do it because eventually, no matter how many f- flying cars on fire you have, eventually people are going to sit somewhere and talk. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And that's the problem that you have to solve. Um, before because it's for, for, for example, it's, it's, I've noticed sometimes that people say, oh, you should see this camera work. It's amazing. And then I see it and it's actually a locked shot with a flying car on fire. And it doesn't, <laughs> it, it's not awesome because of the camera work. I mean, and actually visual effects, people are terrified of doing camera work, especially in, in live effects like that. I mean, they'd rather have 20 high speed lock cameras from different angles and then maybe do a, a, a zoom push and post. Because they, I mean, it's hard enough to blow up a building. I mean, let's not have the camera move go wrong at the same time. Right. It's kind of like if you're a stuntman and you're going to start, uh, if you're going to jump off a building, you don't want to go to the top floor right away. You want to yeah. start dropping off little by little. And that's what the original master class does. It starts showing you the basics. And then once you master those basics, you keep growing and growing like with any craft. Yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of filmmakers are so in a rush to impress people. And I was like that when I first started. I was so in, in rush to to impress, like, look how cool my shot is. And yeah. and sometimes you re- you don't realize that it is a cool shot, but it might not be moving the story forward, or it might not it might not be in the proper context uh, that I need for my story to move forward. So you really need yeah. those building blocks, and it takes time. It's not something you learn over a day or two. It takes yeah, and, time and to and do. That's maybe also that's. This is just my personal opinion. I've seen a lot of new filmmakers who um, who don't really appreciate the size of the skill that some of these things are. And mm-hmm. um, for example, there's one thing that I really like um, about Steven Spielberg, and that is that he's still figuring it out. Yeah, he, and he's the first one to admit and, it, and Scorsese and, too, for that matter. And those and the, the masters. And it's it's strange because when you talk to people who are like <clears throat> halfway up the ranks. They're like really arrogant and smart ass and like, yeah, I know everything, man. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And, and those are the people who will, you know, who give you a, a, a hard time in order to emphasize themselves. But everybody on the top is, is extremely humble and are doing it for the right reasons because they're doing it because they want to figure it out. There's this whole juicy art form that I can spend a, life, a lifetime figuring out. And that's, I mean, that's my impression. A person like... Steven Spielberg is is on his what I don't know 40th 50th movie and he's still there on the set. Oh my god, I just discovered this awesome shot that if he steps in there and then I rack focus and then I push a little forward then this happens. Right. And I mean, it's a master it's it, it's the same thing with a, a master painter. Like they Yeah, but that also means that actually if I mean if you're feeling intimidated um, about people in the film industry like they're looking down on you mm-hmm. the ones at the top are not looking down at you no the ones at the top you would relate to straight out and they, um, and a lot of them are trying to pull them up try to pull people up and try to show them things and try that to- that too but it's um it's all the snotty attitudes are somewhere in the middle yeah. they're, they're they're not that much at the top in my in my experience I, and i would agree with you in my experience i've had a lot of I, i've had a lot of experience with directors in my day and working with a lot of different people over the course of my career and i would agree with you the people that are at the top that i've met that are top of their field or in that area of their of their career uh they tend to be the most humble they tend to be the most kind and the most you know open about what they do where the the young startup who hasn't had life smack them across the face yet, <laughs> uh, which and, it does. It does. <laughs> and it's not being at the top that makes them like that. It, no. It's just simply the, the outlook that they always had. And, um, Correct. And yeah. I think that's great. And it's actually very – it's very disarming. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I think that I think that's great, and I I think that's uh, that's how everybody ought to think about it. So now your other course, which I when I saw it come out, I was just like, oh my god, I can't believe someone's doing this. The VFX for directors, because I'm a mm-hmm. VF, I'm a VFX supervisor as well. I've done and I'm a director, so I've always been a very technical director. So I know a lot about the technical aspects of things, uh, but to explain that to other directors sometimes is such a pain. And just the basics mm-hmm. of what like what a green screen is, you'd be amazed at the shots that come through my door, like, oh, I shot on a green screen. I'm like, what? I, I had one day, <laughs> I had you one were, shot. You, know, you know, listen, I, I have to tell you this. Yeah. Once, yes, I yes, ha- yes, once I had a shot come in or a group of shots where this a director had shot on a green screen, and I use the term green screen very loosely. They threw okay. up They threw up four <laughs> different green screen blankets, four, mm-hmm. and pasted That's them together. That's normal. And pasted, and pasted them, no, 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 but in one shot, and pasted them together. So it was a grid. It was a grid of greens, different greens to Uh make the one shot. And I'm like, you're out of your mind. And then there's a lot of heavy movement, like a sword fighting in the front. And I'm like, you're out of your mind. Like, like and big hair. Yeah. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you <laughs> kidding me? I gave it to my VFX artist and, you know, and he's like, you got to be kidding me. Right. I'm like, look, dude, if you got a roto this, we're going to get paid for it. But seriously, okay. I, mean, go ahead. So I have to then tell you something funny then, because there is, if you go uh, on YouTube and look for a video about East Enders uh, visual effects, mm-hmm. there is a joke. It's a, it's a, it's a, from a comedy show in the UK where they're showing this soap opera, how they're shooting the beer bottles and the people in the cafe separately. And then they're standing there in, in uh, like uh, green suits and lifting their beer bottles. And it's so idiotic. <laughs> Um, it I is so hilarious. stupid because there's no reason to make it that hard. Right, um, right. Green suits. I showed that to uh, I showed that to a bunch of animators at a you know a major, major, major visual effects facility that I shouldn't say what is. Sure, sure. They didn't get the joke no. because <laughs> this is the stuff that they're being asked to do all day long. They just. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, haha. Yeah, uh-huh. we, yeah. I have five shots of like that on my on no, my computer right that's now. The kind of stuff they're being they're being asked to. I mean, because you know the director will let it run wild, and that means that half the scene is going to happen completely outside of the green screen on top of a brick wall, and then now somebody has to roto that. Right, of course. And and when that goes wrong, then they're going to say, "Oh, let's just build him in three D and motion capture it." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just to. Completely not job. It's it's um and oh. and then I was saying, I mean, you could really save a lot of money if you just thought a little bit better about this. And then they're like, what? Nobody here is thinking about saving money. This is that's not no, even a priority. No, so there are some even. of these places that will spend a million dollars on an idea and then say, nah. Oh, it happens all the time. I mean, I have a, yeah. a bunch of the guys on my VFX team are like, you know, they work at the big at the big houses and on big films, big pen, temple movies, and they t- and they tell me the stories of how the directors are like, oh yeah, you know, we need to do, you know, th- like the amount of extra work that they do because they just don't care. They're like, oh yeah, just do that, and then because they know they have the money to do it, they have a team to do it, and they just do and it. That is actually unhealthy to for for people to be on too big budgets for too long is that yeah. there's a certain sloppiness that works its way into it. Yep. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm a nerd in my spare time. I built electronics when I was a kid from stuff that I found in a dumpster. I would solder the components out and learn how to build electronics out mm-hmm. of those. Mm-hmm. And I think that having limited resources, I think you become a better artist. I think you become a, you become a better craftsman than if you just land in the middle of it. And obviously at some point you have to grow to a level where it's not like every single time you have an idea, you hit a wall. It right. would be nice um, to get when you get, or it is nice when you get to a place where you can, oh, now, now there's enough money that we can have ideas and do them. Right. Um, but I mean, I, I see a, a, a staggering amount of waste on some of these. I think what was it? I actually I read in Cinefax on the um, – what was the Johnny Depp? The Pirates of the Caribbean that yeah. they had this African tribe with these stick figures. These, these, this, this, uh, this tribe somewhere. I don't know what it was. Sure, sure, sure. I don't, uh-huh. I don't think I remember the movie. But they had these spiky plant things sticking out of all their heads and they had these hundred people dancing. Mm-hmm. Just basically a roto nightmare and nobody put a green screen behind it. Oh. And, so they were talking about proudly how they rotoscoped that and somehow dodging the elephant in the room that somebody really, really screwed up on this. And that cost like $100,000 because somebody didn't understand that you can't roto stuff like that. It's just and, such a pain. <laughs> and that happens a lot because, I mean, it's also these, these big productions, they're really under pressure. Mm-hmm. And 
Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. You, you you use money as a substitute for concentrating. Mm-hmm. Or for and, or for um, skill or for craft or for a yeah. million other different reasons. Yeah. So, just, but anyway, <clears throat> that's that's where visual effects for directors came from. I mean, I was actually even then I was I was working on the directing actors course, but mm-hmm. I felt that I wasn't ready. Mm-hmm. And I had this other thing that I knew how to do. Um, and so so basically, I mean, I I'm a nerd in my spare time. I grew right. up on Commodore 64 making border sprites. I mean, sure, I, sure, sure. all through the 90s, I sat on my very small CPU Max doing ray tracing and character animation and that kind of stuff. Wow. Um, I, and I, can, I'm, I'm, I completely understand the language you're just speaking, so I completely get yeah. it. <laughs> and... We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And so the thing is that when I got a break uh, directing, Mm -hmm. I already knew what I was doing at the visual effects side. And that means that for me, motion control and character animation and stuff like that, that was home base for me. Um, but I could see how a lot of people really struggle with that. And they don't really have to because it's not like, oh, you're stupid. You don't know this. It's just there's too much for any single person to know everything anyway. Mm-hmm. So the assumption in visual effects for directors is that, you know, you're a smart guy. You just don't know this particular thing. Um, and so I, I felt that it deserved a proper explanation. And what I – what I discovered after a while is that I'm actually slicing this in a completely different way than all the – because every – like a tutorial, for example, in After Effects will like spend 20 minutes on fine-tuning the tracker. And then that's right. what that tutorial is. Mm. And this thing here slices in a completely different way because it, it asks the question is what, what are the key issues so that we can make good decisions on the set? Right. Um, and then obviously in order for you to answer that question, if you're doing match moving, then you need to know – Enough about photogrammetry that you can either place the tracking markers or see if somebody else did it wrong. Right. Um, you need to know enough about keying that you don't bring back these Im- impossible shots where a five-minute time saver on the set becomes a, like a three-week rescue operation in post. <laughs> because uh, the thing is that at a certain point, you can't buy your way out of the problems. For example, if you have a guy with like big – Frizzy hair in front of a brick wall, and you, there, there is not a roto tool in the world good enough to ever make that not a compromise. And that means right. that you can spend, you know, you can spend your entire movie budget on that and still not fix it. And so, at, and at some point, it also means that, <clears throat> you know, whatever allocation you have for for visual effects money, you're now blowing it on 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 getting up to zero instead of blowing it on making something extraordinary. And it's just a terrible investment. Um, no, I, com- I completely so, agree. So that that was the intention, and 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 um, and so obviously it goes very deep in three D animation and and match moving, and especially integration, which is putting two D into three D or three D into two D, because that's that's like ninety percent of all visual effects works with some kind of camera tracking, and then putting either people into a virtual set or putting a virtual set around the little part of the set that's real. Um, that's, that's the vast majority of visual effects. And, um, so that's what you need to be able to make decisions about on the set because you need to think about, you know, you think you need to think about the shot being trackable at the same time as keyable at the same time as as matching the lighting because, and that's actually a place where people go really wrong on green screen. If you take the time to either match the lighting or at least make lighting on green screen that has some kind of attitude at least. (laughs) Because what people usually do on green screen is like, okay, I'm going to do flat barring lighting. So let's just do even soft ambient light everywhere because that'll fit with everything. But mm-hmm. in reality, it fits with nothing. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's much better if you just say, okay, I'm deciding now the sun is there. And now – and then we do some fill and some blue stuff for the hair. And then once you're back in 3D, you just put the sun in the same place and then you're just surprised at how well it blends just because you bothered to match the lighting. You know, the funny thing is I've, I've seen so many the, – the, the art of visual effects is such a deep and complex art. Uh, it's incredible. It's, ins- it's, it's, it's insane. It's insane. They're easily the highest educated people on a film set. It is, and they're yeah, also no incidentally the people who get the least respect. Yes. On production. <laughs> 
And, <laughs> and that's why I think it's it's strange. There's kind of a, in again, in my personal opinion, there's kind of a low-grade depression running among visual effects people <laughs> because they Absolutely. really do get... They do get screwed over a lot. They they pour their heart and soul into making a five second shot work. I mean, they strain their for weeks, personal for weeks. relationships, and oh. then, ah, uh, yeah, no, let's just make the whole thing blue. Um, yeah, no, no, no. I look, I I have conversations with my boys all the time about this yeah. this specific topic, but it's it's such a deep craft. It's so massively deep that even on a two hundred million dollar movie or a hundred million dollar movie. Sometimes they get it wrong. And I see vi- bad visual effect shots in those big movies. So when mm-hmm. I talk to young directors who are arrogant or cocky, I'm like, look, dude, you got to understand as much as you can. If you're going to do a visual effect shot in your movie, you better understand what's going on. Because if not, and you have no yeah. idea how many times I've gotten shots that directors had no idea what they were doing. And then, and then it cost them, like you said, cost them you know, thousands of dollars to fix it. Yeah. Uh, which if they would have just thrown up the right key or thrown up a green screen or lit the thing right or done or put a tracking marker up or something along those lines. Once you get a workflow up, it's actually not that hard to do it right, right consistently. Right. But understand. It's just that if you don't know, then, for example, you'll just have you'll have an intern just put some tracking markers on the background and that's it. Not realizing that the only thing that makes match moving work is tracking markers at different depths. Right, but you know uh, the funny thing is, and I and a couple of my guys I talked to specifically about this problem is tracking markers. He goes, "Can you not put 450 tracking markers in the back? We don't need 400." It doesn't matter. You actually you can track you can track a scene with like six or seven stable right. tracking markers. You can get a, a completely solid track out of that. And then right. if you track the C stands as well, you're golden. Right, and that's the thing that, that a lot of a lot of people who just don't know they like tracking markers. Well, if six are good, then forty five must be much better. And it's like, no, now we got to clean all that stuff out, and it's just more. It of a depends. Pain. I mean, of for course. example, one thing that I'm recommending in the course is that if you're going to do if you're going to do a lot of tracking markers, do those that are off green, meaning that mm-hmm. it's the same green paint, but paint but with like a drop of black in it. So it just goes a little bit down or a little bit up. Mm -hmm. And then you can pepper them in there and you can actually key through them without, I mean, the the variance between the green screen and the tracking markers is less than the variance in just the lighting on the green screen. And that means that you're crunching that out anyway. And that's actually a nice way of working for from a directing perspective because you can just start shooting in different directions and and you're good. And you're ready to rock and roll. Now And you don't have to stop and fix the tracking markers for every shot. So let me ask you um, – I want to ask you this question because I've been uh, dying to ask you this question since I've wanted to put you on the show. Okay. Can you talk about why you do this? Because it is an immense amount <laughs> of work. It's a psychotic, honestly, amount yeah. of work that you do it, it, for, I, for what I, you actually, do. I completely agree. It is a psychotic amount of work. <laughs> and, and there is a difference between having an idea, okay, it's a little bit big but let's get started. Um, to being in the middle of it and just feeling like quitting because and, – and I mean I felt that on the master course not knowing that that would then later turn out to be the small one. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, the ten, you're the just ten standing out. in there and, right. and you're like, oh my god, I made 10 seconds today. Um, how And then I mean oh, you, just, Jesus. You, you, you make a spreadsheet and you, then you say at this rate, this will be done in 2024. <laughs> right. And it just it just becomes a, it becomes a matter of just simply I don't know optimizing your brain. And what's interesting is that I mean so I've made an observation um, about why, for example, TV is often better than films. And and one thing that you yeah. have in TV is that you have really a pressure to. I'm snapping my fingers, by the way. That probably sure, wouldn't sure. be obvious. Um, <laughs> You have a pressure to get some stuff out, and that means that TV scripts, at least I would say often, don't get the same endless Beating, gutting rewrites right. that a mm-hmm. film script would get. Mm-hmm. And that, and for example, you can see on The Simpsons, you can see that very often somebody had a loose, crazy thought, and he just wrote it, and that's like what's in the script, and that's, and that was that. And the same way, you, it's, you can use pressure to your advantage that you can be under so much pressure that you just can't st- – Stop. You can't afford to stop and second guess everything. Yeah. And then you actually get into a very interesting zone where you're just hammering out stuff and you just you can't afford to be self-critical because it takes too much damn time. I, I have the same feeling with what I do with Indie Film Hustle. <laughs> it's okay. such a massive uh, undertaking. I mean, nothing compared to what you do, but you know, I run this entire 
website by myself, the podcast, the post, mm-hmm. the, the every the interviews, every, everything I do all by myself. Plus I have a post production company on the side. Plus I direct okay. plus I direct on the side and I have twins. So, you know, a young twin girls as well. <laughs> so on top of all I do it all on my own. So I've gotten to that point now where you're right. It's like there's so much pressure to continuously I, I don't have time to stop. I have to just keep going. And as new things yeah. and new opportunities open themselves up to me, I have to like, okay, put it in the workflow. Boom. And just and you just kind of keep cranking and just organ. I just keep cranking along and you just and don't. It can actually do something good for you as an artist. And that's also oh, why I'm, I'm starting to appreciate the, the screenwriting teachers or the screenwriting courses where this is about, I mean, writing a full length script in a week because yeah. that does take you to that place where you can't afford to – to second guess everything, and obviously, it, it, when you're writing at that speed, also your your plot and and story structure is going to take a hit. But then you could also work on that later. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But the the point is that you actually go to a different place where you get it out. You are you are more you are more in the zone. You actually get closer to wherever it is those things uh, come from. But right. in terms of so answering answering your question, why do I do this? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, these a lot of these things are things that I would be trying to figure out whether or not there was a course. Um, mm-hmm. There is actually there's something that's beneficial for me just in making them, which is that when you have to explain something to other people you have to understand it a lot better than, than even if you just want to use it as an artist, because you get to, you get to kind of fuzzy thinking and that's fine as an artist. But if you need to explain it to somebody else, then you have to clean it up a lot more. And that's going to confront all kinds of issues that actually force you to go pretty deep down the rabbit hole to figure out that these two techniques are actually two separate techniques. And now they go, I mean, sometimes you take these week long detours in order to (laughs) answer a simple question. Um, but so why I do this is <clears throat> I like to figure stuff out and I would be figuring these, I would be working to figure these things out even if I wasn't making these courses, but I would probably not be as thorough. Right. Um, there is a satisfaction in, in making a model. Sorry, I have to cough. Just give me a sure, second. sure. <clears throat> there, there is a satisfaction for me in making a model like you would be – you know, like you're a scientist and you're trying to figure out something about how two particles behave and then mm-hmm. and coming up with a model that maps to the evidence. I think there's something there's something something satisfying in working these things out. Um, while you're in the middle of it, you kind of want some way out. Because mm-hmm. it's really it's really <laughs> huge. And I mean, especially directing actors, it's I'm I'm looking around and I'm thinking this might be the biggest training program anybody has ever made of anything. Well, I mean, uh, so that so maybe, l- let's bring that maybe into inside the edit is going to beat me to it, but that's uh, fine. It's not a competition. Uh, exactly. No. So uh, let's let's talk about that because I'm super excited about your new <laughs> course directing the uh, directing actors, which is a mystery to most people. Uh, and what you're doing, um, I've had a chance to kind of skim through a few chapters of it, uh, and. Holy crap! <laughs> it's like you've you've done what you've done with the camera work, but now you're beating up act, actors in the same way, but in a good way. In a good way because you're beating up that concept of what is it really like? You are the most methodical teacher I've seen, other than probably Patty. And both of you guys should get together and have a drink because I'd be. Ma- I would love to be a fly on that wall, uh, <laughs> okay. uh, Patty from uh, Inside the Edit, because. <clears throat> You guys are like so methodical about how you break things down and you just are literally just every aspect, every component, every gear about, you know, so it's, it's wonderful, wonderful, one thing to do that with camera work and then visual effects and then, you know, the science mm-hmm. of awesome, but to do it with such a human craft as directing actors, cause you are now directing, you are interacting with people and emotions and history and attitudes and ego and makes them sound very strange. Yeah. I mean, but that's, but that's what, but that's what human beings are. We're all that kind of stuff. And then you're trying to pull emotions out. So please talk a little bit about what this new opus of yours is. So, um, I do actually have a little bit of a secret weapon, which is that, um, 
to top it all off, I've always been really, really interested in uh, in um, in personal growth and psychology, and um, I'm I've done that for so long that I'm not completely incompetent. Okay, uh, that's a great way of putting it. I love that. That's a <laughs> wonderful way. Of put- I'm going to use that. By the way, I've done okay, it so cause... long, I'm not completely incompetent by it. That's great. Great line. <laughs> um. So, um, hang on, I just got interrupted. Maybe you can just make a tiny cut there. So, um, so, um, I was, this was never something that I was actually bad at. I, I, as far back as I, as, as I go, Mm -hmm. um, I've always been pretty decent with actors. Um, it was just intuitive and it was, my skills were very limited. Mm Um, and I also spent all of the 90s producing music and inadvertently I was actually training a lot of the same things. But basically I always – I mean it's – you know, you look at – you sit and look at Hollywood Can Work. What is that? Well, there really ought to be a directing course and they're like, oh my god. I don't know if I'm the world's leading expert on this. Of course. <clears throat> so I actually um, – that – that was a sort of a low confidence, self confidence issue that mm-hmm. uh, that I ended up changing my mind about. Okay, um, because you know this is kind of touchy. I don't want to criticize people and put a name on it, but sure. you know I I I was going to do this course several times with um, some extremely recognized um, directors. Well, acting teachers basically, mm-hmm. directing and acting teachers. These are people who probably most people. Listening have either read their books or heard about. Okay. <clears throat> and and I was completely fine doing that. That okay, let's make a course so where I'm not the expert. I'm just going to help them structure it. But as I started uh, working with them one at a time, um, well, I started working with one and it fell apart, and then I started working with another. Um, I um, I came away thinking, you know what? I think I probably know better than they do. Right. Um, and that's kind of a strange thought to have because still, I mean, I, I feel like I know better than the experts, but I don't feel like I know. Um, or that there was something that was eluding me. There was some pattern to this that I was completely missing, I felt. Um, and I also felt that they didn't really like me asking questions. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> and I, and this is very strange because obviously that's what I would do. I mean, I would sit with them and I'd say, okay, well, so you say that this is a good way to talk to the actor, but I know from my experience that the opposite is also true. And there's this whole tradition over here that, that contradicts to what you're saying. So how do we reconcile that? Right. Um, and they didn't really like that. And they're like, well, I think you just need to come take my class and somehow right, right, in, right. intuitively pick up what they had then failed to explain. Right. Um, and that actually broke off. They both broke it off with me after after a while that they didn't like that. I was asking too many questions and I was being too creative and <laughs> too critical, and too critical of what they're saying. <laughs> well, it's not. See, here's the thing. It's not critical. It's just that um, if we're going to explain this to anybody, then we're going to have to structure this. And the moment I ask any kind of issue that how does this concept fit with this concept and, mm-hmm. you know, you say this is wrong to do, but I have these hundred other people, including major directors who do this successfully all day long. So how do we reconcile that? Um, and so that, that didn't work out. And then I said, um, okay, well then what do we do now? And then I just started toying with that for, for some years in the background. I said, you know what? Um, let me see what I can figure out. And I basically just in, you know, I, as I said, I was never bad at this, but I was sort of in the in the middle space. Um, right, right. But then I started – then then I basically got – said, okay, let's pretend that we don't know anything. Mm-hmm. And let's get everything that anybody knows on this subject here. Basically anything that anybody has ever realized. So, for example, if somebody has success result directing somebody, then we can't unilaterally say that's a bad technique. Then so, that's, so, st- so I'll stop right there. Result okay. directing. Define result directing because that's the first okay, time I've so heard that. Result, so – Here's the thing, you know, you have a lot of thoughts going on in your head and the end result of that is some kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, And for example, if you're sad, then there's all kinds of things going on and then the end result of that is some kind of frowny face and and looking sad. Mm -hmm. And result directing is basically skipping the whole inner process and just 
playing the end result like a mask. And that means, you know, try to make it more sad. Let's make it more angry. Let's, uh, let's do all these things. And so the way most directors talk. <laughs> yes. And so that's still bad. Um, yes. Well, it's not really bad to talk like that. That's kind of the misunderstanding is that mm -hmm. it's not result directing that's bad. It's result acting that's bad. And, and basically, right. if you get the actors to a place where they feel like they have to act a result, then you've done something bad. But up to a certain point, result directing is the most useful thing you can do with an actor mm -hmm. because if, if basically you have to, you have to look at, at, at an actor as somebody who could potentially play every character. And that means that we have to make some decisions about what this character is and what, it's, what this character isn't. Right. Um, and that narrows down the choices um, so that um, – sorry, I just completely trailed there. It's okay. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, my goodness. No, we were talking about result, re so, result, result directing. Yes. Right. So um, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. No, I completely trailed. So, well, look for your earliest editing point and then we'll pick up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, it's okay. No, I, I don't even know what the point I was going to make. But anyway, we can go back to result directing, sure. which – which is that um, it's, the thing is that you you actually are uh, with result directing you're giving the actor a point oh, an end point an oh end no 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 I now I know what my point is sorry to sorry to push you back the okay. thing is that re with result directing you tell the actor what planet we're on and that means that the first directing that you're doing and especially in rehearsal result directing is almost harmless mm -hmm. um, is that if you say make it more sad or make it more angry. That's or, or well, let me put it another way. Really, that's not really ever a good way of directing because there's nothing an actor really can do with this and say, OK, he wants it angry. Let's see. What could I play that could make this angry? And that's the level that we that that we that we have to work from is what you would play in order to in order to get the end result. As soon as you try to play an end result, then everybody becomes artificial and weird. Um, but Bad the problem actor, is not right. really the result directing because. What you're saying with the result ring, if we phrase that in just a slightly different way and you say to an actor, I want to find a way to make this more angry. What could we play to make it more angry? Mm -hmm. Now you're doing something else. Now you're setting a goal and the result is, is a goal, but we're never suggesting or believing that you can play a result because nobody can play a result and do it well. You, you take the biggest Oscar winning actor and make them play a result and they're going to be stinking it up because it's just it it's it's a complete misunderstanding of what acting is. Mm -hmm. To a large part acting is recreating a thought process and letting it roll and just seeing what happens. And that means that you can't really ever get the result that you have in your mind. You can you can hold a result that I know privately that I'm trying to get this scene more angry. Mm -hmm. I might even say to the actor that this is my secret evil plan. I'm trying to get this more angry. Mm -hmm. But in reality, we're trying to come up with what I call active ideas or active thoughts, which – and that's – then that, then we should take a little sidetrack down to what I think acting is. Right. So, well, to, 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 to just jump back a little bit um, – what I did was I got everything on the table um, and to, to try to figure out, is there some pattern here that, that would reduce this, that would, mm -hmm. uh, that would make this simpler and easier to understand? And then suddenly I realized that, oh, my God, oh, yes, there is a pattern. How did everybody miss this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's right, right there. Right, right. Um, and, and so basically that's, that's what turns into the, the layers of behavior, which is the, which is the first eight, um, which is the first eight volumes of the course. And so to, to just explain very quickly what that's about. So basically the, the primary thing that you do as a director is that you help come up with what I like to call active ideas, because mm -hmm. basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to trigger some, some kind of behavior without actually micromanaging and strangling the behavior because, it's like the moment you touch it too hard, it breaks. But you can you can touch it, you can you can push a little bit, and then um, and then it works. And basically, so here's here's an idea for what a behavior is. For example, mm -hmm. if you tell an actor on that line, lower your head a little bit and then blink your eye, that's not behavior. That's like an action. You're you're See, a puppet. It's a puppeting. 
perspective almost. Yes, yeah. well, it's it's too micromanaged. And that mm -hmm. is basically you're, you're trying to now play a result without even caring what would naturally lead to that result. Mm -hmm. But basically, let me give you an example of a behavior. For example, a typical active idea would be playing a moment before that I just got, you know, I just got a traffic ticket on the way over here. And I actually I was going so fast that I lost my license and now everything sucks. Go. What happens to you now? Your whole energy is down. Your The delivery of your lines changes. Mm -hmm. Let's come up with another active idea. Let's try to um, – let's play that you are expecting. That's something that goes into the future that you are expecting that she's going to say some really rough comment. Any minute now, she's going she's gonna to completely shame you mm -hmm. any minute now. Now you're playing the whole scene with kind of an apprehension and you're basically recreating the thought process that somebody would have in that. You would stand in that situation. You would be expecting to get that from the other guy. And now your whole behavior is different, you know, aligns around that idea. Mm -hmm. And that's basically this is what actors do all day long. And um, that's what I felt that I had to map out the whole thing because there are so many different, um, there, there are a lot of different active ideas. Um, you know, what's another one we can play, for example, what I categorize in the present, let's play an as if. So right. let me play as if you are, um, let's, let's play as if you are a police officer and you don't believe that I'm telling the truth. Mm-hmm. That now my entire behavior. So look what happened now. I have a completely different behavior, even whether or not I have lines. Right. Like I have the same behavior before the, uh, be, you know, after the camera starts rolling, but, you know, even between my words when I'm listening. Mm -hmm. And that's an active idea. It's, it's a simple thought that mass produces behavior. And that's the kind of stuff that you can play as an actor. It's, and that's what you have to do as a director is – come up with a lot of these i'll tell you uh, well i'll tell you one uh, a story i heard once that and, and this is not very ethical but this 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 director did it and got the performance out of the the actor he wanted he it was a movie called I, I, tu mama tambien it was a very uh, famous foreign film uh mm -hmm. mexican movie and uh there was a scene where the, he needed a little boy to cry so he just basically walked up to his uh to the little boy quietly and said um your mom and dad just died in a car accident roll camera <laughs> mm -hmm. And that kid was bawling because he was a young kid. Obviously not ethical. Obviously that's, a little, so that's a little so too much tricky too, because it's, too much. it's not meant to get that. It's not really meant to get that real. Or I think it's not meant to get that real with kids. I would rather, yeah, of course, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're so absolutely right. I would you're never not do that. Really supposed to have that kind of a secret from the actors. It's it, this is supposed to be a game, you know. Mm -hmm. And once we know that this is a game, then we can go much further out that plank. Yeah. Absolutely, and absolutely. I, I'm not crazy about him doing that with a kid. Of course, but otherwise, not. No, that's never. That's straight up. Uh, that's straight up directing. But that really also depends on that person actually having the imagination. Right. Um, right. That that means anything. And so that's really that's the other half. Uh, so it, again, like that, uh, again, like with camera work, directing and directing actors is such a deep and dark craft that goes. I don't know. It doesn't have to be. I mean, I I. I don't feel like that anymore. I feel that I get it. Well, no, but like, but like I you were saying, it, but like I you were saying with Steven Spielberg. But yeah, it is so. gettable. There's no question about it. But like you were saying with Steven Spielberg, like there's always something new to learn. There's always something else that you're constantly growing and, and growing as an artist. So it's sure. not something that you learn quickly. It's like being a fine painter. It it, it takes years. No, it's and like years. playing the piano, and right. I think it's a it's a wrong expectation to have of yourself that you're supposed to be able to walk onto a set and then bam, I can block, I can work with actors because obviously all you can really do is fake it the best you can because mm -hmm. it it's it takes some training and yeah. Um, yeah. and experience experience. So um, yeah. so I wanted to talk one last thing uh, which is really important, um, and we talked a little bit about this off air is piracy. And I wanted to kind mm -hmm. of talk about yes. – I wanted you to kind of shed a light on piracy because, look, we all know about you know, pirates and movies being downloaded and courses being stolen and things like that. I, yeah. wanted, I, wanted, uh, I wanted a voice uh, for, my okay. listen, for my listeners to understand what it okay. does to someone like you who puts uh, arguably a decade now of work, thousands and thousands of hours into these courses, and then someone takes it and just puts it out there for free. I want you to kind of talk about what that is like for you. 
Well, that is incredibly depressing. And I, I have to tell you, I've started changing my mind a little bit. And I, I have it here in my Evernote. I have a quote that I heard from somebody that actually helped me change my mind a little bit about this. But basically, the knowledge of piracy, is that, that has really knocked me out a couple of times where I just want to go to bed again. And I'm like, I don't, I don't even have a chance. What am I going to do? Right. But so the reality is that what I've discovered is that there are enough people who think that it's wrong or who don't want to bother that somebody who makes, you know, training programs. And we're not a big company. We're like tiny. Mm-hmm. And and we're not rich. We we can we can just about afford doing it and that's good enough. Mm-hmm. Um but it's I mean, I think it's it really it really rubs me the wrong way when the, the when the discussion about piracy is that oh these big evil corporations. I mean, that might be true for Star Wars, but every <laughs> right. time Every time you do that for a web template or a tutorial, you're probably kicking somebody who's already down. Right. And, and that really sucks. I mean, people think they're like, yeah, it's Robin Hood, man. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And, um, you know, you know, it's, but there's it's no rich, but like there's no a rich statement of, of, of freedom and autonomy. But probably you're taking it from somebody who's trying to eat by. And so I just think it's important to get that straight. But, but that said, I mean, I, that, that also means that I'm incredibly thankful. Every time somebody buys something from me, I take it totally personally. Right. That's I really awesome. do because, you know, and even if, if, if there's like a customer who's a little bit of a jerk, I mean, I, I really let it slide because I'm so happy that somebody is buying it. Because right. without that, I would just have to stop. There's nobody who can afford to stop everything and do this for this much time. Right. <clears throat> but I wanted to, I want to read you a quote that I heard somebody, somewhere because this was really getting me down mm-hmm. so much that I, I have to tell you the truth. When Hot Moves was done, mm-hmm. I had the master sitting on my desk mm-hmm. and I couldn't bring myself to release it. Wow. It sat on my desk for a week without me putting it out because I know that as soon as I put it out, it's going to be torn to pieces by people who feel that, you know, it, not just that they can copy it, but that they have a right to. Right. And and that just bummed me out so much that I couldn't bring myself to release it. And it just sat there. And then I just finally had to think, well, what else am I going to do? Never release it? And then <clears> – <throat> but let me read you a quote here that I dug up in my Evernote mm-hmm. that says that um, you are too worried that people will steal what you have. <clears throat> Let this be your wake-up call, especially if you're an artist or a writer or an entrepreneur or a creative type, that there's always more to be gained from sharing knowledge than from hoarding it. Don't worry about people stealing your work. Worry about the moment they stop. Be honest, helpful, and undeniably good at what you do. No clever marketing scheme or social media buzzword or competitor can substitute can be a substitute for that ever. Whenever people want what you have, regardless of the circumstances, you're doing it right. That's awesome. That's an awesome, and, awesome. Quote. And I felt like, you know what? I, this gives me some peace and then let's leave it alone. I hope, I hope it's possible to be good enough that somebody will say, you know what? Uh, let me buy it. That's, I'm, I'm so glad you said that. Uh, and I wanted, I wanted people to understand what, what I wanted to put a face to the, to the piracy sometimes, because sometimes okay. it is, it is bigger. <clears throat> like, oh yeah, I just downloaded the latest Star Wars movie. I'm like, oh, they've already made a billion dollars. They don't need my two dollars, my ten dollars. But that might be that. In the a, next movie over is an indie movie that's getting killed because of that. It's an indie movie that yeah. doesn't have a chance. Mm-hmm. And everybody who's behind that movie now doesn't have a chance. Right. I mean, I, I, okay. Yes, it has a marketing effort. It, it has a marketing effect as well. But mm-hmm. I don't know that the, that the marketing effect of piracy compensates for the, the, the lost for the fact that you've just, uh, you've just removed the entire demand. Okay. So th- I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with the last three questions, which are, I ask of all of my guests. Um, Go for it. what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in life or in the business? Oh my God. You should have prepared me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think, um, this may be my favorite. I come on. 
Sorry, you're going to have to cut there again. Sure, no worries. All right. No, it's just that uh, it's evening here and yeah, sure, um, sure, I'm sure. being asked by my family some things. Um, I um, I don't know. I think a lesson that has taken me a long time to learn is to only do big things with people who already have experience being successful. Because Ooh. I've had some of the biggest financial accidents in, in my life by making some things that were actually successful with people who then tore it apart. Because somehow subconsciously they believe this is the first and the last success I'm ever going to have. So I'm going to just have to give me, give me, give me as much as I can. Instead of saying that if we could make it this big with this effort, imagine what we can do if we keep going. And that's, that's profound, actually. That's actually an I, awesome I, answer. I got really punched in the gut from not knowing this. Actually, in the music industry, I was trusting who I thought was my my the one person that I could trust. And I got completely steamrolled over. I lost four years of income. I I was hammered back to the Stone Age. Wow. And like with $40 in my cupboard, so I could always buy some milk and cornflakes and a half tank of gas. Wow. That's I a- got hammered back. I lost like major six digit money and um and that was um that was because in retrospect they uh, they weren't ready and i think for me it's important to be successful with people who don't panic when success happens and say okay that's great now let's see uh, how we keep going in that direction and who have a more more measured approach to success and failure that is something that i think a lot of uh a lot of uh, filmmakers should take to heart because I've, I've met a lot of, I've heard so many stories about independent filmmakers who they make a big hit. And then all of a sudden people are like, Oh, well, you got into Sundance and now like, and that's exactly, they've never experienced it. They've never gone through it. And because well, but, of that, and, and everybody on their team, they might have a manager who's suddenly inside <clears throat> panicking. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's successful. I don't know what to do. Let's, 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 let's take something. Right. This is and it. This is the grab. Tearing it down instead of saying, "Okay, our tree is sprouting. Let's see what happens if we keep watering it." Right. Exactly. Let's just pull. And then let's- they just and then they just tear it down. And obviously, those people who did that to me, I mean, I had to big legal. I'd spend the last money that I had suing them mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, until I finally had to give up. But by then, thankfully, I'd done enough damage. Right. And right. 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 That, that actually, I well, I guess I don't know. I was happy knowing that they. That they were down. <laughs> <laughs> Revenge is a, is, a, is a dish best served cold, sir. Uh, yes. So, um, all right. So, what are your top three favorite films of all time? And it could be just the three films that come up to you at this moment. Okay, I can I can name two. I like Back to the Future, and I like I the Shawshank it. Redemption, and Damn. then I don't know what else. Anything else? Actually, kind of. I kind of like Titanic. I know that's the minority <laughs> opinion. <laughs> I enjoy. I love Titanic. I enjoy Titanic yeah. a lot. Uh, and then, what's one of the most under most underrated films you've ever seen? Oh, yeah. You really should have prepared. I should. I, I should have sent you these before. I apologize. I apologize. Well, I mean, it's like you. You once in a while think if somebody ever asked me what would I answer, and then I have a great answer, and now I've forgotten. <laughs> um, it's okay. Underrated. If you I really don't know. I'm I'm probably going to have to bail. I don't know. No worries. It's all good. So where can uh, where can people find you? So yeah, search Hollywood Camera Work on Google or HollywoodCameraWork.com, and that's work, not works. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, uh, per thank you, man, so much for being on the show. Thank it, you, man. I mean, it's been a great episode. I mean, you've given us so much information. Uh, about cool. the craft and what you do. And that's why I wanted you on the show, man. So I really appreciate you taking out the time. That is awesome. I really appreciate it. I Did I lie? Did I lie? I mean, seriously, the amount of stuff that he dropped, all the knowledge bombs he dropped in this episode were amazing, guys. I mean, it, and I, I, I at the beginning of the show, I talked so much about the course and how, how, how what a fan I am of it. So I won't do it again. But if you want to go uh, and get to the course, go to HollywoodCameraWork.com. And the as promised, the 30% off coupon code is the word HUSTLE, H-U-S-T-E-L. Just type in the word HUSTLE in the coupon code and you will get 30% off not only the directing actors course, but anything the Hollywood Camera Work has to offer it is man i'm telling you it is amazing so you definitely got to check it out guys i hope you guys enjoyed my talk with purr 
And guys, if you have any experiences or tips or advice about working with actors, head over to our um, Facebook group and give us some, drop some knowledge bombs on us, man. Uh, go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Facebook and you can sign up for our ever-growing Facebook group, which is uh, almost at 6,000 uh, members right now and growing daily. So definitely go and check that out. And of course, if you really want to take everything up a notch as far as your filmmaking knowledge is concerned, definitely check out the Indie Film Syndicate, guys. It is something that I'm very proud of, and it's growing all the time. It is a monthly membership uh, that you have access to all the courses that I do, and uh, it really is full of a tremendous amount of knowledge that they do not teach you in film school. So it's pretty, pretty crazy. Just head over to IndieFilmSyndicate.com. And as I said before, the show notes for this episode are IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 106. So as always, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.